Welcome to Warriors for Christ podcast. I'm Sam. Uh, I will be here doing another episode on the phone by myself. And, and, and part of it is Kyle and I were going to get together and then he wasn't able to at the last minute. So we had a lot of these saved up to do the, the temptations. So I'm just kind of running through all of them today. Uh, so you'll um, this one and the next one will be without him until we meet again. Uh, but today we're going to continue again on the temptation uh, series that we're on right now. This is going to be part three, and we're going to look at don't test God, and this is our warning. Now, the examples that we're going to look at today are primarily a lot of the examples of Israel. However, it's not just Israel. This is also applied specifically to us, that we need to make sure that we are not testing God. What does it mean to test God? We kind of looked at that a little bit in part two. Um, And now here in part three, specifically, who does God say tested him? You know, part two says, you know, God tests us to find out what's in us. And you kind of figure out if you don't pass the test of the temptations, but you're not overcoming but sinning, then that would imply that you're then testing God. And that's what we're going to find out today in part three. And as we look through starting the Old Testament examples, it goes right into the New Testament because God specifically says This was for our example, our warning that we don't follow in the same way. So why don't we open up in prayer and we'll get get started digging into God's word. Father, I thank you another day that we can uh, look at your word. And this time, Father, we're going to look at the warning where you warn us and you tell us, do not test God. Just as Christ says, do not test God. And so we want to make sure that we are not testing God. And so what does it mean to test God? And and how does God define that? So we're going to get into your word, Father. I pray that you will convict people by your word, that they'll open it up, that they'll read, they'll see what you say um, and what your ways are. And we thank you, Father. Pray that we'll be edified by this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So starting off, we're going to we're going to look at Exodus and we're going to start Exodus chapter 17. Now, as you go through this, there's um, two places where God specifically says that Israel tested him or tempted him. But we're going to find out that even though it was only mentioned in two places, uh, when we get to Numbers chapter 14, he's going to say that Israel had already done it 10 times. You're like, well, how did they do it 10 times? I didn't see where he said they tested or tempted God 10 times. But we're going to go back and look at those because it ends up being the disobedience. So in Exodus chapter 17, verse 2. Now, the background of this is the people end up quarreling. Well, why do they quarrel? Well, verse 1. When the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of Yahweh, and they camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. So they had no water. Verse 2, Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test Yahweh? So here it says that, well, no, they, they quarreled with Moses. But yet Moses then basically says, Okay, yeah, but that's basically equivalent to you quarreling against Yahweh. And so I'm sure the people might have said, I'm not quarreling with God. We're going to find out, you know, if you've ever listened to the episode we did where we cover the, uh, you know, the the rebellion of Korah, you'll understand that clearly. The people thought that they were serving God. Uh, Continuing on later in verse 7 in the same chapter, Exodus chapter 17, verse 7, um, and this is uh, as they continue with the, the water, and actually, let me go verse 6 and 7. He says, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Orb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel, and because they tested Yahweh, saying, Is Yahweh among us or not? And again, that's how God sees it. You're basically challenging God. Is he there or not? And so those two places you have where it says 
they tested God. Now, all the way until you get to Numbers, chapter 14, you don't really have that word used again until Numbers, chapter 14. In Numbers, chapter 14, verse 22 to verse 23, uh, he says, Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurn me see it at all. Now, when you look at this, this is where they just spied out the land and you got the bad report that came back. And so the people, you know, cried out and said, oh, you know, we're going to die. You brought us here to kill us. Let us go back to Egypt. And so God's like, OK, that's it. Now, notice he says that they tested him 10 times. Well, when you go through and you read up to this point, nowhere do you find that it says in Scripture they tested him 10 times. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. We just found the two, which was really a single event in Exodus chapter 17. But here in Numbers, it says 10 times. But notice he says, and have not listened to my voice. You see, what you find out is when you don't listen to the voice of God, or when you don't walk in obedience and obey the voice of God, as we found out when we looked at, you know, what is the greatest commandment, love the greatest commandment, we did a an episode series on that, then if you look and you'll know what it means, it means do you obey his voice? Do you keep his commands? Do you walk in his ways? Do you abide in him? Not through your own effort or strength, but through the will and the power and the spirit of God. Then if you do not, then you're basically testing and tempting God. God basically said after the 10th one, he's like, okay, I'm done. And notice he says that these people will not enter the land. But yet he swore to their fathers that they would. But now he says they won't. You see, that's another thing you'll find out is God will change his promises. And you'll actually find out that God's promises are conditional depending on whether or not you obey him or listen to his voice. Now, we covered a lot of this. You know, you look at people say, oh, but yeah, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, he'll never leave me nor forsake me. Well, that's true. He does say that. And if you keep reading in Deuteronomy chapter 31, he then promises that he will forsake people if they don't obey him. Now, we did an episode on that. Uh, God will never leave you or forsake you, and it depends. And we go through and what God says, and we look at his scripture and his passages where he forsakes people after he said he would never do it because it was conditional, and they didn't meet the conditions because they didn't receive the gift that God wanted to give them, that new heart and new spirit. Now, I want to now go back and look at the examples of then where did Israel test God or tempt him, uh, or I guess you should say not obey his voice or sin against him. When you actually go and you look back, going back to Exodus, you actually find 10 places where they, this actually happened. 10. 10 where they sinned against God. From Exodus, after they left Egypt, reading all the way through until you get to Numbers chapter 14, where we're at now. So let's go back and look at those 10 times. Because Israel did this, and it cost them their life, many of them. So turning back, let's go all the way back to Exodus chapter 14, where we have the first testing or tempting of God. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 10 through verse 12. And this is after they left Egypt, and they were traveling out to go worship God, and they had left. And Pharaoh decides to go in pursuit with his army. Verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to Yahweh. Then they said to Moses, It is because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? 
Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt? And we said, Leave us alone, that we might serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So here, they tested and tempted God. They were sinning against God. They didn't have faith. You see, God said he was going to bring them out into a, into a land flowing with milk and honey. That's what he told them. That's what he had Moses tell them. Now, all of a sudden, as soon as they go out and they see the little bit of adversity, they fear, they become frightened, they doubt, and they sin against God. As you keep going in, num- in Exodus here, uh, the next place where they sin against God is in Exodus chapter 15. Now, notice, I am going to highlight this before I get there. At the end of chapter 14, after, you know, God gives them a deliverance and they they part through the Red Sea and he causes it to crash over the uh, Egypt army and he, they all drown. Um, notice what it says at the end of chapter 14 and verse 30 and 31, because this is like many people today. They'll say, oh, but I do believe God. They had faith in God. They went out through the Passover lamb, the blood. You know, the destroyer didn't touch them. They then, they then gathered. They went out to go serve God. And then calamity happens and they fear. And then God redeems and he saves them, right? He redeemed them. And, and then they, they depart through the Red Sea. And, and then all of a sudden, oh, but, but let's rejoice and believe. Verse 30 and 31. Thus Yahweh saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw all the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which Yahweh had used against the Egyptians, the people feared Yahweh and they believed in Yahweh and in his servant Moses. So here you're thinking, oh, but it's a good thing. They believed. They believed enough. They followed God. They went, they went. And, but, but it's like, but nobody, we're always going to grumble. We're going to complain. We're going to sin because, you know, that's in our nature. We can't stop, not until we get this glorified body. That's what people will say. The problem is that is a lie. That is a lie. That is not the promise of God. That is not what happens when you receive the new heart and the new spirit that we've covered in these episodes. That's not what happens of the person who's overcome sin that we covered and we talked about in the overcoming sin episodes. That's not true. These people who believed and feared God, you'll find out because of their subsequent and continued disobedience, even though they believed, even though they worshiped God, even though they sang songs to God, He subsequently forsakes them and destroys them. And this is going to be our example, my example, your example. It's important that we understand these things and not come up with our own thinking. Do not try to come up with a different way of thinking to get out of the the way of God. It will not work. God will judge each man according to his judgments at the end of the age whether or not you are the new creation or not, based upon what he says. Exodus chapter 15, verse 22 to 24. So the background, they're out, they're into the wilderness, and something's going to happen. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Sur, and they went out three days into the wilderness, and they found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Now, earlier, if you remember, we covered the, the uh, later verses and um, this, that the, this had happened before with water, and they grumbled. But God tests them. He tests them to know whether or not they would walk in obedience and obey God. So uh, so that's the second one. As we continue to look, we're going to go now to Numbers chapter 16. In Numbers chapter 16, it says, in verse 2 through 3, actually I want to go, yeah, 2 through 3. So they departed, right? They, they went out of Egypt, and it says in verse 2, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would it have been that we died by Yahweh's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full? For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill 
this whole assembly with hunger. And so again, you have the people, it's like, my goodness, they, they just keep uh, challenging God. But God, again, God wants to test them. And, and we cover this in um, God test you. And this was the previous episode, right? If you keep reading, it says, then, then Yahweh said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. Uh, the problem is they didn't pass the test. So here we know they didn't pass the test. The only two places where it accuses them of testing God is, is in the chapter 17. But here it says God was testing them. So they grumbled. Um, earlier they had doubt. So think about, do you ever doubt? Do you ever grumble? Do you ever feel like, oh no, I'm in trouble? Or, oh, what woe is me? What's going to happen? Or, oh, why, why did this happen? Or, or you find yourself complaining against God? Well, then you're in trouble. Because that's what Israel did. It didn't go well for them. God accuses them of testing him. Uh, whether or not they would you know, pass the test. Now, for Israel, um, they didn't. They grumbled. And so they're rebuked for it. And when you look at this, when they went out here, and as we're going to continue to look in uh, chapter 16... In verse 16 to 20, with the food, they were told to go out and gather. And in verse 16, it says, This is what Yahweh has commanded. Gather it, every man as much as he should eat, and you should take an omer apiece according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. And this is gathering um, the manna. And so the sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some little. When they measured it out an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. So Moses said to them, Let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. And and this is what God said too. And so some of the people left part of the food until morning, and it bred worms, and it became foul. And Moses was angry with them. Well, it wasn't just Moses that was angry with them. Yahweh their God was also angry with them. And so in verse 28, uh, then Yahweh said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? And in this case, it was because after they did that, God said on the seventh day, hey, don't go out and gather, but I'm going to give you double portion on the sixth day. So on the seventh day, you can rest because I provide for you. Uh, But they didn't listen. And some of the people went out looking for food on the seventh day. So God is just getting really frustrated because they're continuing to test, to tempt God because of their lack of obedience, which really comes down to lack of faith. And and a lot of it comes down to their their bad heart. Uh, We're going to find out later, you know, greed um, comes into, into play as well. Now, in Exodus chapter 17, right, we already, now this we already covered before, but we're going to cover it again. Uh, this is now the um, uh, the fourth time. And so here, in Exodus chapter 17, verse 2 through 3, he says, when they had no water, so again, they had no water, and it says, therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test Yahweh? So the people thirsted their, th- for water and they grumbled against Moses and said, why have you brought us up from Egypt to kill our children, our livestock with thirst? And again, God is not happy, right? He, he gets frustrated. So then he, he tells them to go and um, strike the rock so that water will come out. And uh, because they tested Yahweh. And that's one of the places where it says they tested him, which we, which we covered. Um, you know, the verse 2 and then also the verse 7. Uh, the next place where it will turn over to Exodus chapter 32 and this is the golden calf. Probably remember that one. And so in verse 7 through 8 of Exodus, he says, uh, the Moses spoke, or then Yahweh spoke to Moses and said, Go down at once, because Moses was up on the mountain. 
He says, for your people who you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and they have worshipped it, worshipped it and sacrificed, saying, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So Moses went down and, uh, you know, he had to plead with people because God said in verse 10, Now let me alone that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them, and I will make you a great nation. Now, as part of this, Aaron, uh, because of the people, they're prone to evil, and, and they uh, went and said, Hey, you know, go make us, uh, um, make us a god because we don't know what happened to Moses. Um, so they make this molten calf. And earlier in verse 4 and 5, he says, he took from their hand and fashioned the gold that they gave him uh, with a tool and made it into a molten calf. And, and he said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, when Aaron saw that he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow we shall feast to Yahweh. So they're still celebrating to Yahweh, their God, but now they add this extra thing into it, this molten calf. God's not going to have anything part of it. You can't you know, add and, and do this other idol worship and, and thinking that you serve God. Yet many people have idol worship in their lives every day when they put the world above God and think that they can go serve God at the same time. But God doesn't accept it. And at this point, God actually does bring some judgment on them at the point. Um, he tells uh, Moses, and when you go look at verse 27, still in that same chapter, he says to them, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Every man put your sword on his thigh and go back and forth uh, in the gate, from gate to gate in the camp, and kill every man his brother, every man his friend, and every man his neighbor. Um, and those were the, the people that didn't you know, separate and repent. And so 3,000 people were killed there. But God wasn't done. Uh, and still in that chapter in verse 32, verse 33, Yahweh said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But go now, lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sins. Then in verse 35, it says, Then Yahweh smote the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. And, and of course, you know, you know, more people die because of that. And that was, that was the next right test that they did to God because they didn't obey. Um, some of those people, God removed immediately because of that. Then, as you continue, in Numbers chapter 11, uh, the next recorded place where the people were disobedient. In verse 1, it says, Now, the people became like those who complain of adversity in hearing of Yahweh. And when Yahweh heard it, his anger was kindled, and fire from Yahweh burned among them and consumed some of them on the outskirts of the camp. Therefore the people cried out to Moses and prayed to, the, uh, prayed to Yahweh, and Moses prayed to Yahweh, and the fire died out. And, and so, again, you know, people grumbled. God wasn't having it. He, so you can already see he's at the point of, he starts, you know, eliminating some of the people as they're doing this. But it just kept coming up because the problem was they didn't have a new heart. And we, we read that later in Deuteronomy. We cover that in the God Requires a New Heart Part 2 episode going through the Old Testament passages. So I can say that because that's what God says when you read through the whole story of what the root problem was. And, and so God still had an anger against these people. They continued to test and to tempt him. Again, in Numbers chapter 11, as you read in verse 4 through 6, it says, The rabble who were among them had greedy desires. And also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? So now he's getting mad because now they're greedy. They want more meat. And in verse 5, he says, We remember the fish which we used to eat for free in Egypt, and the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There's nothing at all to look at except this manna. And they start complaining. So, of course, God's anger is kindled. He's not happy because they continue to test him and to tempt God. So, as you keep reading in verse 18... Uh, to verse 20, still in Numbers chapter 11, he says, Say to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow you shall eat meat. 
And, and for you have wept in the ears of Yahweh, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat, for we were well off in Egypt. Therefore, Yahweh will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat, not one day, not two days, not five days, not ten nor twenty, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils, because, and, and, and it becomes loathsome, loathsome to you, because you have rejected Yahweh who is among you, and you have wept before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? You see, their doubting uh, and their anxiety that they had, it's accused to them before God as, You reject God. You're doubting. You reject God. You don't believe. Where's your faith? A lot of people don't know worry and doubting is a sin. It's no different than murder, adultery, all the other things. Because it's in the heart. A corrupt heart is a corrupt heart. And God teaches that when you, when you study his word, which we have done. Uh, so, as you continue to look still in chapter 11, uh, verse 33 to 34, uh, he says, While the meat was still between their teeth, because they went and they gathered meat, before it was even chewed, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against the people, and Yahweh struck the people with a very severe plague. So the name of that place was called Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had been greedy. So again, God knows the heart, and he knows the heart of those that are being greedy, and he killed them. He took their life while the food was still in their teeth, because he sees the thoughts and intentions of their heart. And with all that, we then come to Numbers chapter 14, which was the final test of God. And this is when the people in chapter 13 went out to spy out the land. Uh, You had the, was it the 10 people that gave bad reports? Caleb and Joshua gave the good reports. And then the people complained again in verse chapter 14, verse 1 through 4. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and they cried and the people wept that night. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would it be that we have died in the land of Egypt, or would that we have died in this wilderness? Why is Yahweh bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? So now he's saying, oh great, you know, we made it through Egypt, we made it through the wilderness, but now we have this next peril of these giant people in this land that we're supposed to be going in, that God promised to take. So they don't believe God. No, they complain. They said, oh, it would have been better if we died in Egypt or we died in the wilderness along the way. Why now do we have to go into this land that he says in verse 3, to fall by the sword? Our wives, our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Verse 4, so they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and let's return and go back to Egypt. So God is not happy. Verse 11, God says to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? How long will they not believe in me? Besides, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst, I will smite them with pestilence and dispose them. I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they. And then as you keep reading, reading, he then says uh, that we read earlier in verse 22 to 23, that surely all the men who have seen my glory, my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, have yet put me to the test these 10 times, have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their father, nor shall those who spurn me see it. And he goes on and says, oh, but there's exceptions. Not just every man. He said he refers to Caleb. He says, nope, Caleb has has a different spirit, and he has followed me fully. He says he'll be able to enter. But with the remaining people, in verse 27, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel which they are making against me. Say to them, as I live, says Yahweh, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Verse 29, your corpses shall fall in this wilderness. Even your numbered men, according to your number, from 20 years old and older, who have grumbled against me, they will fall. Verse 30, surely you shall not come into the land which I swore to settle you. You see, he swore to settle them, but now he's changing his mind because they grumbled. He says only Caleb and Joshua. He also says your children, who you said would become a prey, I will bring them in and they shall know the land which you have rejected. 
But as for you, verse 32, your corpses shall fall in the wilderness. And then again, he says in verse 35, I, Yahweh, have spoken. Surely I will do this. Uh, I will do all this evil. I will do to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In the wilderness, they shall be destroyed and there they shall die. As for the men who Moses sent to spy out the land and returned and made all the congregation grumbled against him by bringing out a bad report concerning the land, verse 37, even those men who brought out the bad report of the land, they died by a plague before Yahweh. And so this is what you see. We, you know, this, and this is our example. This is your example. You cannot grumble. You cannot complain to God. Uh, you cannot be failing the test, worry, anxiety, whatever it is, uh, you know, sin. Well, we already know what happens with, with that. Um, and, and actually, we know because there in the very next chapter in verse chapter 15, um, you have then somebody goes and they gather some sticks um, on a Sabbath. And this person that gathered sticks, uh, they, they ask God and say, what shall be done? And so in Numbers chapter 15, verse 35, Yahweh said to Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him because he disobeyed the voice of God. And he goes on again, he says in verse 40, In order that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy to your God. For I am God, Yahweh your God, who brought you up from Egypt, uh, from the land of Egypt to be your God, I am Yahweh your God. And then you go on in Numbers chapter 16, you have the rebellion of Korah. The people didn't like the ways of Moses, the ways of God. They accused Moses of making up his own rules. They said, no, nope, we're a people of God. God is with us. And God's like, okay, uh, tells Moses, set him apart, we'll test. God will pick who's his. And that's when you have the earth swallows up them. Then fire comes down uh, and kills 50. 250 of their distinguished men, and they still complain and don't believe that God has chosen, uh, that he has not chosen them. They still complain, say that they think they're people of God, Moses is, is causing all this, and then God sends forth a plague, and another, you know, almost 15,000 people die. And, and it's like that today. Uh, people think that they can make it their way, that just because they say they're a people of God, because they think they're a people of God, they have peace with God. So you, do you overcome the tests? Do you grumble? Do you complain? Are you people like Cora? Do you think that you're right? You might be thinking, oh, you're wrong. Well, does God say you're wrong? Is your belief system line up with what God says? You may be thinking, ah, oh, but this is Old Testament. It doesn't apply to me. No. Well, we're going to find out it does apply. As a matter of fact, this is specific for our example. Let's continue on. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 16 uh, through 17. He says, You shall not put Yahweh your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. You should diligently keep the commandments of Yahweh your God, his testimonies and his statutes to which he has commanded you. Verse 18. You shall do what is right and good in the sight of Yahweh that it may be, be may be well with you. As you continue to look in verse 25, it says, It will be righteousness to us if we are careful to keep all this commandment before Yahweh our God, just as he has commanded us. And we went through and covered so much of what is the greatest commandment. Um, again, love. What does it mean to love? And so this is just reiteration of what God has already commanded. You can either agree with what God says, or you can argue against it. Turning over to Psalm chapter 78, and you have this stuff repeated. Because it was important, and God wanted this repeated, so that the people wouldn't repeat their folly. And so, in, in chapter 78, he talks about, you know, God bringing out Israel, and that they're to continue in his ways. When you look in verse 7, it says that they should um, put their confidence in God, and not forget his works, but they should keep his commandments. Verse 8, they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. You see, that was their problem. As you keep reading down in verse 16, he says, he brought forth streams from a rock. He caused rivers to flow down, waters to flow down like rivers. 
yet they still continued to sin against God. They rebelled against the Most High in the desert. And in their heart, they put God to the test by asking for food according to their desire. The people were more focused on themselves and not God. Verse 19, they spoke against God and they said, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? And so, God wasn't happy with those people. It goes on, it says in verse 21, Therefore Yahweh heard and was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob, his anger mounted against them, because they did not believe in God and did not trust his salvation. And that's key. Uh, A lot of people don't understand that when you doubt, uh, when you fear, when you grumble, when you disobey God, he basically accuses you as not believing, as unbelief. We're going to find that in the New Testament when we get there. And all this is pretty much repeated, these examples. Um, as you as you continue to, to look in Psalm chapter 78, it says in verse 32, In spite of all this, they still sinned. They did not believe in his wonderful works. You see, when you sin... God charges that against you as unbelief. Verse 34, when he killed them, then they sought him. And they returned and searched diligently for God. And they remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer. Verse 36, but they deceived God with their mouth. They lied to him with their tongue. Verse 37, for their heart was not steadfast toward God, nor were they faithful in his covenant. So even here, when, when they, they go off and they think they're seeking and serving God after he kills them, they, it says they diligently turn and they seek for him. But then God says, but you deceived. You lied to me. Why? Because it was their heart. Their heart still had not been changed. Their heart still had not been turned. Until your heart is turned or changed, it's in vanity. It's a vain worship. Verse 41, still in Psalm chapter 78. Again and again, they tempted God. They pained the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power. The day when he redeemed them from the adversary, when he performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the field of Zoan, and turned the rivers to blood and the streams they could not drink. He sent among them the swarms of flies which devoured them. And he goes through and talks about all the plagues that God did in Israel, or I mean not in Israel, in Egypt, uh, to bring them out. And yet, in all of that, in spite of all of that, he says in verse 54, So he brought them to his holy land, to the hill country, which is his right hand, uh, which his right hand had gained. He drove out the nations before them, and he appointed them for an inheritance by measurement. He made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and rebelled against the Most High God and did not keep his testimonies, but turned back and acted treacherously like their fathers. And this is how God sees. You see, if we don't get a new heart and new spirit, then we are accused of testing God, walking in disobedience, not having the new heart. But yet, when the fear of God comes, it's like, oh, quick, let's turn back to God. Let's remember him. You know, kind of this, this cycle that people go through because they, they can't overcome. They fall into sin and despair. So then they turn to God. The problem is you aren't turning in true repentance because you're stuck in a cycle. That's not true repentance. God would say you're deceiving yourself. You're lying to him. Your heart has not yet been steadfast because you don't have the new heart and the new spirit. I pray that you're understanding these things. And, and this is like a summer here. It's a beautiful psalm, Psalm chapter 78, that's going through the struggle. And all this is for our instruction. Now, turning over to Psalm chapter 95. And verse 8 through 11, it says, Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness, where your fathers tempted me. They tried me, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who err in their heart. They do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, my wrath. Truly, they shall not enter my rest. 
Now, all these passages I'm reading, these are going to be quoted in the New Testament, specifically about us in our example. That's why I'm going through these. There's so much to go through. I'm just highlighting the ones that are covered that we're going to cover earlier in the New Testament. Psalm chapter 106, verse 12 through 15. And through all these psalms, there is so much truth. But in Psalms, chapter 106, verse 12 through 15. And this was after, uh, you know, he, he covered, he um, destroyed the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. And the water, waters covered them. And there's no, none of the Egyptians were left. Then it says in verse 12, Then they believed his words. Then they sang his praise. Then they quickly forgot God's works. They did not wait for his counsel. And they craved intensely in the wilderness, and they tempted God in the desert. So he gave them their request and sent a wasting disease among them. Now, you see, remember, we covered this. Israel, remember, uh, they they doubted. They're like, oh, no, the army's coming. Oh, and they, they tested God and they grumbled. And then God delivered them. And then remember, it says they feared God and they believed and they rejoiced. Here it says they sang their song. But then again, it says, oh, but then they forgot. God in his eyes is like, oh, you you quickly forgot. Earlier he says you committed treachery. You craved, you did this. So God says, okay, send a wasting disease among them. And and this is the thing. You you cannot be somebody who's like a yo-yo. You cannot be cycling up and down, up and down. You know, I oh, I can't overcome. I can't overcome. I'm not the person who counts it all joy when I encounter testing. Um, which we covered in part one, and we're going to cover more in in part four. We're really going to pound it home with God's word so you know what the truth is. You know who the liar is. There's so many people who go to church and they're being lied to because they aren't being taught the whole truth. You know, later as you keep reading in Psalm 106, it then talks about the rebellion of Dathan and Abraham. You know, we read that, the rebellion of Korah, where, you know, fire blazed up and consumed them because the people, again, were becoming envious and, and they weren't believing. But all this, there's so much truth in the Psalms. You know, all these as you read them, it's, it's really good. Uh, I'm just highlighting a couple of them. All right, let's now go to the New Testament and we're going to go to Hebrews. And in Hebrews, a lot of this is going to sound familiar. Now, We did a study of Hebrews. We went through each of all the chapters, chapter by chapter. We label them. You can go and and look at it from much greater depth. I'm going to highlight some things here. Now, starting off in Hebrews chapter 1, it just makes the case that Jesus is greater than angels. Now, why does he make that case that Jesus is greater than the angels? Because, chapter 2, verse 1, For this reason, because Jesus is greater than the angels, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a payment, a just payment of wages. Remember, the angel of the Lord is what led Israel through the wilderness. It's the angel of the Lord that the people didn't obey the voice and the words that were spoken. He was the angel of the Lord speaking the words of God, but he was an angel. Here he's saying Jesus is greater than the angel. If if Israel didn't obey the angel that led them through the wilderness and they received their payment of wages, which we know was death, but now we have Christ who is greater than the angels, then he says in verse 3, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, referring to Christ, Jesus, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with him by signs, wonders, and miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So the whole, the whole point is, hey, listen, if the people God destroyed when they didn't listen to the angel, and he brought the message of gospel, the gospel salvation message, then what do you think is going to happen if you don't listen to Christ, and Christ is greater than the angels? That was covered in chapter 1. So with that as the backdrop, we then go into chapter 3. Chapter 3, here's the concern, and here's the example. Chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, 
Do not harden your heart as when they provoked me, and the day of testing in the wilderness. We are fathers tested me or tempted me. Again, all the, you know these words are tempt. It's the 3985 Perazzo um, to tempt. Uh, by testing me, they saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said they always go astray in their heart. Do you catch that? The heart. And they did not know my ways. Remember, they couldn't walk in the ways of God. Verse 11, I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, speaking to us, speaking to those who become a partaker of the heavenly calling with Christ, which was discussed earlier at the beginning of the chapter, the holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Jesus, who's the apostle and high priest of our confession. So he's speaking to us. That's chapter 3, verse 1. So us, um, whose house Christ is the head over, and verse 6, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and boast firm until the end. These are the people he's speaking to. He's speaking to us. So in verse 12, he says, take care, brethren, you who are listening, take care that there not be in any one of us or any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Now, it doesn't matter what you say. You can say you have a believing heart. The question is whether or not God would say you have a believing heart. Does it result in obedience? Do you overcome? Has sin been cleansed and removed and put to death? Do you have the new heart and the new spirit? Verse 13, encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, that no one will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, and then he says, well, who was it that provoked him? Verse 16, who provoked God when, when they had heard? Indeed, was it not all those who came out of Egypt, led by Moses, with whom God was angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? You see, now we realize that, again, to test God are those who continue to sin against God. Grumble, complain, doubt. Uh, not obey his voice, sin, well, God destroyed them. They fell in the wilderness. Those are the ones who had the hard heart. Those are the ones who didn't believe, even though it says they feared God and believed, even though they worshiped, even though they sang songs. Verse 18, and to whom did God swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Verse 19, so you see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Remember, we read that in the psalm. To not obey, to sin, because you can't overcome, because you don't have power, you don't have the new heart and the new spirit, you can say you believe, you can worship, you can sing songs. God says it's a vain worship. Your disobedience, God charges you as unbelief. Now, again, the warning to us is our example. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, let us fear. That's right. You better have a healthy fear. Why? Conditional if. If, while a promise remains of entering his rest, because it is a promise, any one of you might seem to have come short of it. Well, how do you come short of it? Verse 2. Indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also. Did you hear that? You see the good news, the gospel? It was preached to Israel in the wilderness just as us. Most people don't understand it and, and think it doesn't apply because they don't understand the greatest commandment. They don't understand what God's always required from the beginning. They don't understand that the, old, the new commandment is the old commandment. We did episodes on all these. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, you need to go listen to those episodes. Get your Bible open because your life depends upon it. People who preach contrary are leading you to your death. You need to stop listening to them because if they're preaching contrary to God's word, why in the world would you continue to go sit at their feet? They're being taught and led by the spirit of the devil, not of God. So, verse 2, Indeed, we've heard the good, we have had good news preached to us just as they did, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was you not united by faith in those who heard. Remember, they continue to doubt. Verse 3, for we who have believed enter that rest. As you keep reading in verse 6, he says, Therefore, since it remains for some to enter, 
and those who formerly had the good news or the gospel preached to them, they failed to enter because of disobedience. You cannot have disobedience. You cannot. And the yoke is easy if you've come under the yoke of God. Uh, Verse 11, Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. I pray that you do not test God. I pray that you see that this is our example. You cannot struggle and live the same life of struggling that they did. That is not a life that gets the blessing and the true wages of life. I I want to go and look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. Here God again reinforces that Israel was our example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the same cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into the same, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. Verse 4, they all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from the spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. But there was a problem. Verse 5, Nevertheless, with most of them God was not well pleased, and they were put to death in the wilderness. Verse 6, These things happened as examples for us, so that we would not desire the things that they desired. Do you hear that? It's our example. It's your example. Do you see it as your example? If not, then what were you taught? You were taught wrong. You need to understand the Old Testament. You need to see how the Old Testament and the New Testament are one and the same. If you don't, it's because you have not been taught properly. You need to get out your Bible and dig in deep. Verse 6, they happened to us as examples. Verse 7, imperative command, do not be idolaters. What does it mean to be an idolater? As some of them were. It is written, the people sat down to eat and drink. They stood up to play. You know, and and, and in uh, Samuel... When Samuel addressed Saul, he accused him of idolatry and divination when he didn't obey the voice of God. He wasn't doing idol worship. He just didn't obey the voice of God, and God accused him of idolatry and divination. And he rejected him, took away the spirit that he had given him, and gave him an evil spirit to torment him until the day he died. Go read about it in Samuel. We covered it, I think, in the New Heart episode that we did as well. So he said in verse 9, Nor let us test the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Verse 10, Nor grumble as some of them, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyers. Verse 11, These things happened as examples, uh, happened to them as an example, and they were written down for our instruction upon the whom the end of the ages have come. This is your example, my example. You cannot struggle with sin like they did. That's testing God. If you test God and you don't come into obedience by by faith through God's grace, through the new heart and the new spirit, then you'll be destroyed like they were destroyed. He goes on and tells them that we're to overcome and not fall. He then tells us that every single temptation that we face, God will provide a way of escape so that we endure, we overcome. Remember the man that was blessed that we covered in in part one? The man who endures, the man who perseveres, not the one who fails. You see, this falls in the very end of the example. It all comes together. And we're going to dig more into this when we talk about the man who has a proof of faith, who overcomes the temptation, the man that's blessed. That will be in the final part four episode. But I pray that you're being convicted by these things. These are the things that should be pinnacles of your foundations and teachings and the platforms. But no, most people go to church, they hear a couple verses about God, and then they hear the pontification of man spouting their head knowledge and their their twisted and worthless examples that can bring no, no power and salvation to man that cannot free them from their sin. As a matter of fact, they tell them there'll always be sin, that they cannot stop sinning, that a new heart, that, that, that such a thing does not exist. They're liars. You continue to sit at their feet, you're provoking God. You're provoking God. Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus rebukes Satan when he was being tempted, he says, Jesus said to him, 
On the one hand, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, and that, that word uses the same base word for the temptation, parazo, but it's Strong's 1598, and it has um, EK in front of it. It's uh, ek parazo, which is basically to be in the temptation, um, to like tempt or test thoroughly. So let's tell him, you better not do it. You better not do it to God. It's written, don't do it. Again, Israel did that. Uh, as you go and you look at Acts chapter 5, I want to look at verse 8 and 9. And this was uh, when you had the selling of the property and the people fell down dead because, again, they were lying. They were sinning in the presence of God, and it, they were made an example. So Acts chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. This is Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, after Ananias died, uh, because he didn't uh, speak the truth, he says, And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, Why is it that you have agreed to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And this says a great fear came over the whole church and all those who heard these things. And God used that for whatever reason. He used that them for an example. We don't know how, how many examples God is going to give us to come into repentance. Uh, but if you're hearing the message and you're being convicted, you really need to make this a priority in your life to get to the bottom of it. You need to put your, the, the, the start devouring the word of God and asking God to lead and guide you because your eternal life is at stake. And this is very serious. You don't know when God's going to be like, okay, I gave you enough tries. You aren't responding to my truth. I'm done with you. And he removes you from the earth or something worth, worse happens. So you really need to, to take this serious. Uh, and with that, I think we'll, we'll wrap this up and we'll close in prayer. And the next one, the part four, we're going to go into um, passing the test. So with that, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the word. And Father, I thank you that we have such strong examples of history that are written down for our instruction. Detailed examples going through a people who were redeemed with the blood of the Lamb. They put your faith and believed and went out to follow, to worship, to serve you. When faced with adversity, people would say, oh, it's normal to doubt, to, to not believe, to waver. But then after you demonstrated your power, they would believe, they would, they would fear you, and they would rejoice and sing songs. But you don't accept that cycle. And as you tell us, and we cover in the New Heart episode, God requires a new heart in the Old Testament passages, the issue with them was they didn't have the new heart and the new spirit. And so they continued to struggle much of the exact same way that people in the quote-unquote Christian church struggle today, being led by deceivers, just as in the days of Israel, all the many people continuing generation after generation after generation, even unto today, because they are not feeding people truth, they're not telling them of the true power of God that overcomes and destroys sin and sets your people free. I pray, O oh God, that people will be convicted by your word. They will dig deep and come and beg you to open their eyes and to teach them by your spirit and to show them any barriers that remain that are preventing them from receiving the new heart and the new spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.